All right, let me invite you to take your Bible and turn back to the book of Psalms. We are in Psalm 119 this morning, the longest psalm in the book of Psalms, the longest chapter in the entire Bible, 176 verses. You ready? Uh, Logan, our uh, discipleship pastor, told me he would give me $100 if I made you stand and read the whole thing to you. Uh, so I really want $100, uh, but I'm not going to do that to you. So take your Bible, Psalm 119. Uh, we're going to look specifically this morning at, at verses 9 down through about verse 17. We're not, getting to, we're not going to cover for the sake of time the entire psalm, but I think these verses we're going to look at this morning will help you get to get, get a feel for the entire psalm. So take your Bibles, Psalm 119. Turn there, if you will. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, that's okay, because in the, the seat before you, down in the book rack, you should find a copy of the Bible. Pick that copy of the Bible up and find Psalm 119 with us. If you don't own a Bible, please take that Bible home with you. Read it and learn about the God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. Psalm 119 is where we're going to spend our time together this morning. Go ahead and find that and we'll read some of those verses together in just a few moments. So, so uh, I know some of you in this room are, are, are like me. You've got children that are back in school. And I know all across our church, whether you have children or not, we've got a lot of children in our church and we have families that, that home school, families that do public school, families that do private school and everything in between. And, and I don't know how it's working out for your kids or grandkids, but it's been, a, it's been a pretty interesting year in our house just as far as getting back into the group of school. Most, most of you know, or at least some of you know, that my oldest son, Luke, he, he has a fracture in his knee. So he's been on crutches for a couple weeks and, 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 and we'll be on crutches for a couple more weeks at least, hoping that it heals up. And so he started middle school this year. It's just been kind of an adjustment to start middle school with an injury and trying to navigate the hallway on crutches, so it's been kind of tough for him. And Hudson has, has gone into third grade, and, and so far, so good. Um, but Hudson has a tendency to, sometimes to, to forget things. He, he, just, he just, I guess he has a lot on his mind and trying to accomplish a lot, and he just, just kind of forgetful sometimes. And so, so he had this big social studies test this past week, and, and when he had this particular test, you know what he forgot to do? He forgot to bring home his study guide, and he forgot to bring home his social studies book. Two things that were essential for him to pass the social studies test. And so, so it, was just, it was just mass chaos at our house when he got home and realized that he did not have his study guide nor his social studies book. And, 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 and it was immediately went to, to the worst case scenario, right? I'm going to fail the social studies test, which I said, yep, you probably are. Let this be a lesson to you, right? You bring your stuff home. You bring your study guide home. You bring your book home. I mean, yeah, so, so tough lesson, right? But, but do it. So, so he walked around the house just over and over again. I'm going to fail this test. I'm going to fail this test. And I kept telling him, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And he kept, he kept walking around, I'm going to fail this test. And it went from, I'm going to fail this test to, I'm going to fail the third grade. I'm going to fail the third grade. I'm going to fail the third grade. I say, wait a minute, you're going to fail the test, but you're probably not going to fail the third grade, right? He went into worst case scenario uh, because he realized that unless he had the materials that he needed, the study guide and the book, he would not make it on that test. Actually, I just let you know, I think he actually passed the test and did all right on it. So good for him. But man, it was an ordeal at our home on that particular evening. And I tell you that, I tell you this, you know this, if you're following Jesus and you been following Jesus for some time, uh, that, that life is tough. And, and a lot of the challenges life throws at us, we aren't going to do well if we don't what? If we don't have the materials that we need to do well, specifically the Word of God. So here we are, and I don't know if you've been, been, been keeping up with us as we journeyed through Psalms together, uh, but, but we are really on the third Psalm that we've studied now, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, and now Psalm 119 that deals with our response to the Word of God. And, and this particular Psalm 119, all 176 verses deal with the Word of God. Now, what we're going to see in a moment when I, I read the Scripture to you is, is the psalmist, we don't know who wrote this psalm, but he, he asked a particular question. How does a young man stay pure. How does a young man stay pure? And I, I, I don't know, but I'm just assuming that, that for many of us, that's not something we think about a whole lot. 
We think about how, how we're going to get through life, and we think about how is God going to bless me, and how can I be a good Christian, and all these other things. But, but to ask the question, how can I stay pure? I don't know if that's a question that, that, that we often ask, but that's what God desires from us. It's kind of that neglected pursuit that honors the Lord. God desires us to pursue purity. Now, when I use that word purity, I don't know what comes to mind to you. Maybe lots of different things come to mind to you. But when, when we use that word purity, we're talking about what? Do you remember a few months ago when we studied the book of Ephesians? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes and he says what? Be imitators of God. To imitate God is to imitate his purity, to think like him, to respond like he would respond, to have his heart, his character. You see what I'm saying? To be pure is to be like God. That's what God desires for us. And, and I, I know there are times when we kind of think about that, but I really do think that the pursuit of purity is kind of for a lot of us, a neglected pursuit. We just don't wake up in the mornings asking the question, how can I be pure? How can I be today more like God? How can I today pursue a life that imitates God? This is the question on the mind of the psalmist. And he writes a whole psalm, 176 verses, really to answer that question. And the answer to that question that he says in 167 verses is to get into the Word of God. Now, I know you're, you're at a church like this and we get into the Word of God every single week and we talk about the importance of the Word of God and the value of the Word of God. But hopefully as we look at this passage this morning, this is going to help us to think about what does it look like to allow the Word of God to help me be pure in this life in such a way that it honors God. Now, just before we read the text as a way of review, don't forget this, that the book of Psalms is divided into how many different books? Five different books, right? And these five different books in a lot of ways are to remind us of the first five books of the Old Testament, the law, the Torah. And we said over the last few months that we've been in the book of Psalms that, that the book of Psalms has, has different themes for each book of the book of Psalms, right? And so here we are in the final book of the book of Psalms and, and it has this theme of, of, of this. God is on his throne and he is going to establish his kingdom forever. Many of the Psalms that we read in book five are collected after the exile. So this Psalm that we're reading this morning was either collected or written after the exile. You remember the exile, how the, the Israelites, because of their disobedience and rejection of God, they went into captivity for 70 years. They were slaves in Babylon, but, but now they are back home and they're longing for the day that God will establish his kingdom forever. And if God is going to establish his kingdom forever, then the people of God need not to repeat the mistakes of the past. And the mistake of the past was what? That they did not take the word of God seriously. They did not meditate on the word of God. And that led them to sin. And so you can understand why Psalm 119, this long Psalm about the word of God fits very nicely into book five because this is what the people need and it's what you need too. This reminder that if we're gonna be pure before God, we need his word. And so I wanna show you this morning, just as quickly as we can, three commitments that I think this Psalm is calling us to make as we become a people who long to be pure in our walk with him. So take your Bibles, look at Psalm 119 with me, if you will, go ahead and rise to your feet. We're gonna begin in verse nine and read down to verse 16. Psalm 119, verses nine through 16. Before I get to verse nine though, let me read to you verse one because this may sound familiar to you. Verse one sounds an awful like an awful lot like Psalm 1. Listen to what it says. How happy, or your translation might say, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. That sounds a lot like Psalm 1, doesn't it? Now come on down to verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you, Father, that we are uh, continuing just to learn from the book of Psalms, what it means to worship, what it means to long to know you, what it means to walk in purity. And Father, we live in a world uh, that does not promote what this Psalm teaches. This world does not tell us to be like God. This world tells us to be whoever we want to be. Your word tells us something different. And so, Father, as we study your word this morning, as we uh, think about the words of this particular psalm, I'm trusting that your spirit is going to do a work in us. You're going to reveal truth to us this morning. You're, You're going to show us, Father, the beauty of walking in purity with you. You're going to show us what a joy it is to be people of your word. So thank you now, Father, that you're going to speak to us. As you speak to us, help us to listen carefully to what you're saying. Help us to listen with hearts that want to receive your word and obey your word. And ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So there you have it. We read it as we began this passage, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? Now, I look across this room, and and obviously, as you look across this room with me, uh, there's diversity in age in this room, isn't there? Uh, We we have quite a few people in this room. They're just kind of starting out in life, and, you know, they're they're early to mid-20s. We have some children in this room, some teenagers in this room. We have some some younger parents in this room, or if you're like me, a middle-aged parent. We have some grandparents in this room. In this room, we kind of, you know, are all across a spectrum in regard to where we are in life and our age. And, and so some of us, we read this verse, and we say, how can a young man keep his way pure? And we think, well, we're not young. This really doesn't apply to us, right? Or, or we are young and, and it's just not a question we're asking a whole lot. I wanna, I wanna help you to understand this. This is so important, right? That God really does want his people to be pure all the days of their lives. I think there's a temptation as a parent or a grandparent to think about our children, our teenagers, and make the assumption that at some point in their journey, they're going to do what? They're going to sow their wild oats, right? Some of us make the assumption that there's just coming a day that, that when our kids get to be teenagers or in college or in their 20, young 20s, uh, they're just going to, you're just going to sow their wild oats. And there's this expectation that that's going to happen. And according to the word of God, that doesn't have to happen. That's not God's design is that we get to a certain age in life. We get to to 18 or 19 or or 20 or 21 and we we go out there and we sow our wild oats. That's not the expectation that God has of his people. Or you think about being young. Think about being 18 or 19 or 20 or 21. And there's this thought that goes in our minds that says what? I want to enjoy life right now to its fullest. That faith thing, that church thing, I'll come back to that when I'm a little bit older. When I get married and have children, I settle down, then I'll think about the things of faith. You see, I think a lot of times on both sides, whether we're older or we're younger, uh, there's this assumption that those young years will be wasted that we'll pursue what we want to pursue and we'll sow our wild oats and then come back to the faith later. But that's not the testimony that God wants us to have. The testimony that God wants us to have is that all of the days of our lives, as the Spirit of God is at work in His children, we honor the Lord. That we don't go through seasons where we say, okay, now it's time to sow my wild oats or now it's time to live for me and I'll come back to the faith later. Uh, That's not the way we approach life. What the psalmist is saying, he's saying, I want to know, I want to know how all the days of my life, whether in my, in my youth or whether in my later years, all the days of my life, how can I stay pure? And, and there's this urgency in the passage because here's the reality. I don't know if you know this or not. There is a world that's trying to do what? Disciple us. And so if you think about it, I think the first commitment that this passage is calling us to make, whether you're young or whether you're older, whatever stage of life you're in, I think the commitment this passage is calling us to make, and it's a real simple commitment, but just, but just hang with me. I will apply God's word now. Not later on in life, 
when I've settled down or whatever the case may be. But right now, whether in this stage of my life, whether I'm young or old, right now, I will apply God's word now. Because here's reality. In every season of life, there is a world that is trying to disciple you. Here's the reality, right? You know this. What worldview are you most exposed to? Do you know what a worldview? It's the way you view the world, right? A worldview is a philosophy, a philosophy of life that says, this is the meaning of life. This is how you get the most out of life. And if you ever uh, took a class in college on philosophy or even in high school, you were introduced to different worldviews of uh, things like naturalism, or existentialism, or secular humanism. You were maybe introduced to those in college or in high school, and they all essentially say the same thing, right? You live out your truth. You be you. You do you, whatever that looks like. Uh, what's true for you might not be true for somebody else, but it doesn't matter because it's your job to create your own destiny. destiny. It's your job to create your own purpose in life. Be true to yourself, right? Follow your heart. Whatever feels good and feels right to you, that's what you pursue. You know this. That is the worldview that you and I are exposed to every single day, whether it's in media or social media, on our jobs, in the classroom. This is what the world is screaming to us. This is how the world is discipling us. This world wants you to be a student of this philosophy that says you do what you think is right. Forget what everybody else says. You create your own purpose. You create your own destiny. And what that does, and you know this because you've seen this firsthand. What that does is what? For us as Christians who are being discipled, maybe unintentionally by that worldview, then we begin to question everything that God says. Because God says something completely different than you be you. You pursue your own truth, follow your heart, create your own destiny. God says what? No, you surrender all that to me. You follow my heart for you. You live for my will. You live for my design. So you have this world that's trying to disciple you in this worldview. And, and, and God is saying, no, 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 it's this way. And then you have this conflict within you. You see what I'm saying? What worldview are you most exposed to? And what worldview has the most influence over your life? Because there's reality. I think every one of us in this room would say, yeah, well, God influences me. That's why I'm here. I'm, I'm in this church because I believe in a biblical worldview. Yet your life may show that really what influences you most is that secular worldview that says you do what you want to do. How do you know that? Because for some of us, the evidence that we're being discipled in a secular worldview is we become what? Soft on sin. You see? You do whatever feels good to you. Who am I to judge you? You do what you think is right. Who am I to judge you? Who am I to call that wrong? Or who am I to say that's against God's will? Who am I to say those things? And we become soft on those things that God says are rebellious against him. That's how you know. That's how you know that, that this secular worldview is influencing you because you become soft on those truths in Scripture that God says, this is my will and this is not my will. You see what I'm saying? Because here's reality. Most of you I see every single Sunday morning. Some of you I see more than that. I see you on Wednesday nights or, or maybe on a Sunday night. But can I tell you that that exposure to the things of God for 45 minutes on a Sunday morning is not enough to influence you to walk by faith? You need more? Because every day, every moment of the day, this world is exposing you to a secular worldview. Do you think 45 minutes here listening to a guy like me go on and on is going to really influence you that much when you're putting everything else into your life over and over again? I think we need to be honest with ourselves. You need to apply God's word now. And the question you have to ask is really right now, today, in this moment, what has the biggest influence over your life? Is it the word of God 
or is it something else? And I'm just telling you, I'm telling you because I, I've been at this long enough to know if your only exposure to the things of God is an hour or so on a Sunday morning, it is likely that the word of God is not the biggest influence over your life. Do you follow me? And so there's this, there's this urgency here. I need to apply God's word now. If I'm gonna fight against the secular worldview and, 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 and be pure, right? Because you see what the psalmist says, how can a young man stay pure? By keeping his commands. That means I need to do something right now to pursue that, that pure lifestyle. I need to apply God's word now. But now watch this. If I'm going to apply God's word now, that means I have to think something about God's word. Now watch this, that leads us to our second commitment. I need to apply God's word now and I need to treasure God's word within. You see what the Psalm says in these verses. Come on down, look at what it says. How can a young man uh, keep his way pure? Verse nine, by keeping your word. I've sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have, here it is. I have, verse 11, I have treasured your word in my heart. Some of you might have a different translation. You might be reading from the King James or the, the New American Standard Bible or the English Standard Version. And, and it might be something like this. I have stored your word in my heart. Or if I have hidden your word in my heart. Now, now look what it says. I have treasured your word in my heart. I have stored your word in my heart. I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? So I might not sin against you. You understand this, right? The, the reason why we put ourselves under, under the teaching of God's word week in and week out is not so we, be, we can become, right, biblical geniuses who can win Bible trivia contest. You understand that? The reason why we, we, we study the word of God week in and week out isn't so we can impress people with how much we know about the scripture. No, the reason why we are here week in and week out understanding the word is so that we might not sin against God, so that we might live in purity before him. You've got some things that you treasure, don't you? When Stacy and I got married, you know, 14 years ago, 14 and a half years ago, before marriage, we, we got engaged. And I don't know if, if any of you did this when you got engaged, but it was a big deal back in the day because back in the olden days, and some of you remember these olden days, we had these things called newspapers. You remember that? And they would actually deliver them to your house and, and someone would throw it on the yard and you'd run out and get in the morning time and all that's gone now. But that, that used, and back in the olden days, in that newspaper, when somebody got engaged, you remember this? There was an engagement announcement in the newspaper. And my mom and my dad, they were, they were so proud because I was getting old when we got married. I was, and they were worried I was never gonna get married. And so when I finally got engaged, they were real excited. And they would make sure they put that announcement in the, in the paper. So, so in the paper on page, whatever it was, was a, was a picture of my, my bride-to-be as, as beautiful as she is. And, and the engagement announced it, Tom, you know, Tom and Patty Metter are proud to announce the engagement of their son, Tommy Metter to, to Stacy Green, her maiden name, and, and this beautiful picture and ride up. And, and so what happened was we got a copy of that paper, right? Because we wanted to keep that. We wanted to treasure that announcement as a reminder of that day that we got engaged. I threw that paper away. I don't know why I did it. I don't even remember doing it, but I did it. Um, I just, I have a tendency to throw things away. And so, so what Stacy and I do not have is we do not have a copy of our engagement announcement because I threw it away. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, you should have treasured that. It's really Stacy's fault. <laughs> because she should have stored it, right? She should have put it somewhere out of my reach, kept it safely where I couldn't get to it. She blames me. I blame her. I'll let you be the judge, right? But, but that's kind of what, what I think is going on here, that, that, that there's this reality, right? Now, come on. There's this reality that what we treasure, we store, right? What we treasure, we store. And, and, I, and I want you to know this. I don't know if you ever think about this or not, but you treasure words. Do you know that? You, you might treasure your own words. And, and I hope this isn't you. I, I don't think this is you. Uh, the reality is, but there's some people, and you, you, you know these kinds of people, and you probably don't like to be around these kind of people. There are people that treasure their own words. You know what I'm saying? Very opinionated, think they know everything. They like to listen to themselves speak, right? You, you know people who treasure their own words. Listen to me. And then there are those of us who treasure the words of others. 
And we are so easily influenced by the words of others. Let me, let me ask you this question. And how many of you, you like pumpkin spice lattes or pumpkin spice coffee? A few of you do. All right, hang with me. You, you've been there. Let me, let me show you some pictures, right? It, it's that time of year at Starbucks. Now, I read an article this week that I thought was really, really interesting. When, when, when Starbucks brings out their pumpkin spice whatever every single year, they experience in their store on average a 25% increase in foot traffic into their store. That's pretty impressive, right? So you can understand why every year they bring out pumpkin spice coffee. But, but you know this, that when that pumpkin spice comes out, everybody starts going crazy. I don't know when it came out. It was like last week, a couple weeks ago, pumpkin spice came back out at the Starbucks, at the Dunkin' Donuts, and everybody wants their pumpkin spice. And, and now, I don't know this, but you can get pumpkin spice, all kinds of stuff, right? Or think about this. Have you seen these uh, pumpkin spice graham crackers? You can go there some Dunkin' Donuts, you, you, you goldfish, you can get those, or go on this next slide. You can get pumpkin spice Doritos. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Who doesn't want pumpkin spice Doritos? Or think about this, pumpkin spice Spam. <laughs> You act like you don't want that, but it sounds, or think about this, pumpkin spice bologna, right? Or, or, or think about this one, pumpkin spice toilet paper. I don't know, I don't know. Or think about this one, pumpkin spice brake pads. Pumpkin spice brake pads are back, right? But this is what happens. This time of year, everybody goes crazy about pumpkin, pumpkin spice. And, 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 and I really don't want to hurt your feelings. And so just, just take this just as whatever, however you want to take it. But, but here's what I'm convinced. I'm convinced that none of you really like pumpkin spice because pumpkins are bad. I mean, I don't understand. I'm just convinced you don't like pumpkin spice. And I'm convinced the reason why you go and get pumpkin spice and, and you enjoy it is because Starbucks told you to right? Because listen, now follow me, follow me, and you might disagree with me, and that's okay, we can disagree. But I'm convinced if pumpkin spice was really that good, they'd sell it year-round. But they don't. Why? Because they know it's not that good. But they have convinced you. They have convinced you through advertising and marketing that, man, this time of year, what you must have is pumpkin spice, right? You see, we are so easily influenced by the words of others. You are. I know that was all in jest, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying. We're influenced by worldviews, by words. We treasure the words of others. We want to hear others say of us, good job. We want to hear others say of us, I accept you. We treasure those words. And, and then we begin to listen to those words, even if those words lead us astray. Or think about this, you treasure your own words sometimes. You, you treasure the words of others, but do you really treasure God's word? Because here's the reality, right? No, go back to the last slide. I'm sorry, I'm not there quite yet. What are you going to do when temptation comes? You follow? What are you going to do when temptation comes? Remember what the psalmist asked. How can a young man keep his way pure? I treasure the words in my heart so I might not sin against God. What are you going to do when temptation comes? Well, that all depends. It all depends on whose words you treasure. Do you follow me? Because if you treasure your own words above everybody else's words, then when that temptation comes, you're going to do what? What I think is right. What I feel in my heart, I'm gonna follow my gut instinct. I'm gonna do what I, I want in the moment. You see? Or if you treasure the words of others, I'm gonna do what he tells me because I want to make sure that, 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 that I have his approval. I'm gonna do what she tells me because she seems to be pretty smart. And before you know it, you're led away from God because you've treasured your own word or you've treasured the words of someone else. Or think about this when you treasure God's word. This is what the psalmist is getting at. I want to treasure God's word because when I treasure God's word, it keeps me from sin. I need to apply God's word now. I need to treasure God's word within you. You remember the example of Christ in Matthew chapter four. In Matthew chapter four, when, when he's tempted by the enemy and the enemy tempts him, Jesus responds by doing what? Reciting scripture over and over again because he had treasured the word in his heart. What I'm thankful for here at a church like this is we have Awana. Now, if you're a, an adult in this room, unless you're volunteering, you don't go to Awana, but our children do. 
and they're memorizing the word of God week in and week out. Can I just tell you something? If you are 25 years old in this room or 85 years old in this room, you need to do what those children are doing in that room across, across the building. Because there's something that happens. Come on now, you know this. When, when you begin to become an adult and you're not in Sunday school anymore, right? You're not in a wana anymore. You know what you fail to do? Memorize the word. Come on, come on, think with me. Now, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to embarrass you or try to make you feel bad or anything like that, but, but just think with me honestly. When's the last time you committed some scripture to memory? I'm just going to tell you this. Every one of us in this room need at least, at least, at minimum, a top 10 list. You at least need a minimum of top 10 verses that you can run to, that you've treasured and that you've hidden in your heart. So when the enemy begins to attack, you can remember the truth of God's word. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's something like Galatians 2.20, right? I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives within me, right? That, that when I am tempted to sin, I remember who I am. I'm not my own. I belong to him. Or, or maybe I need to remember in that time of struggle, right? That Romans 8, 28, that, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Or, or James 1, 2, right? Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go through trials of various kinds, knowing that God, right, produces endurance during those seasons. I don't know. Maybe it's when you're, you're walking through those difficult days that you need to remember Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maybe it's John 3, 16. You need to remember when you have that conversation with neighbor, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for you you. Maybe in those times when you feel guilt and shame, you need that reminder from Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's that reminder, right, from Romans 5, 1, that inside of a relationship with God, there is peace with God. I don't know what your top 10 list is, but I'm just telling you, my friend, you need a, a top 10 list of verses that you are memorizing because the enemy is going to attack you. And when the enemy attacks you, whose words you treasure, now watch this, whose words you treasure are going to determine how you respond. Do you follow me? And my fear is, is that many of us, we treasure not God's word, but our own words or the words of others. And so I just want to challenge you, maybe even this afternoon, to sit down. Maybe it's a good family project for a Sunday afternoon and think through what are 10 verses that we need to memorize as a family? What are 10 verses that I need to memorize? And just start there. I would love for you to memorize even more than that. But there's something powerful about memorizing the word of God. And I'm afraid it's a discipline that many of us neglect. How does a young man keep his way pure? By applying God's word now, by treasuring God's word within. How does a young man keep his way pure? by applying God's word now, by treasuring God's word within. And let me go on to this last line, we're done. And by learning God's word deeply. I need to learn God's word deeply. Look what the Psalm says in these verses. You come down and you see what he says in verse 12. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. Now, now circle that, that phrase, teach me. Now I would challenge you to do this. Psalm 119 is 176 verses. I would challenge you to read through this psalm on your own this afternoon and circle all the times where you see the psalmist say or write, teach me, or something like that. Teach me, teach me. You see, th there's, there's this reality that, that, that you can memorize Scripture but not actually understand what they mean. You know that. We see that with our Awana kids all the time where they'll recite a verse and then we ask them, hey, well, what does that mean? And and they don't quite know yet. And that's okay. We teach them, right? So it's one thing to memorize scripture, but it's another thing to actually understand. And that's what the psalmist is saying. Teach me. You come down and look at what else he says. Verse 15, for example, I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways to meditate. Now, when you and I think about meditation, we think about what this world tells us sitting under a, a tree somewhere with your fingers out and just kind of emptying your mind. Meditation in the Christian faith is not emptying your mind. It's filling your mind with truth. You see, to meditate might look like this for you. That when you go home this afternoon and you're sitting around the lunch table, you revisit this passage of scripture. 
And you just talk about what does it mean for a young man to keep his ways pure? You begin to think about the application of it. Meditating on scripture is just bringing it back to mind and, and thinking on it and thinking about how it applies to your life. But you see what the psalmist says, teach me. I want to meditate. I want to treasure it, store it. I want to meditate and think upon it. Teach me, God. There's this interesting book uh, called Peak. And in and, 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 and this book, Peak, the, the author, he's trying to answer a question. How long does it take for someone to come, become an expert in something? It's an interesting question. The conclusion they come away with is that it takes someone to become an expert in any given field about 10,000 hours of diligent study and pursuit to become an expert. 10,000 hours equals about 10 years. In this room, we've got some experts. In our church, we have some experts, right? We have experts in, 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 in engineering. I know we've got people in our church who've been working for Boeing for years. They become experts in their field. We've got some educators in this room. Some of you have been teaching for 20, 30 years. You become an expert in education. It takes diligence. It takes study to become an expert, right? Here's why I know. I've been playing the piano for a lot of years. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but, but I've been at it a very long time. And here's what I know. I, I, I think I could do this. I think any one of you, if you would come up to me after the service and say, hey, can you teach me how to play Amazing Grace? I, I, I think, I think that I could take any one of you and within a few hours teach you how to play Amazing Grace on the piano. Not just one finger at a time, but actually playing with chords and making it sound kind of nice. I think I could teach any of you in this room to do that. But, but if I could teach you how to play Amazing Grace, do you know what that doesn't make you? A pianist. I mean, it just does it. You know, one song. It doesn't make you an expert in the piano. It doesn't make you a musician. Because that takes years to develop that skill and to understand rhythms and dynamics and, and phrasings and musicality. Those things take years. It takes years to become an expert. And, and, and here's what I've learned in my life. There's lots of things that I want to learn. There's lots of, of knowledge that I want to gain. But there are many things in this life, most things in this life, I will never be an expert at. And that's okay. But... There's one thing that I must pursue in being an expert at, and that's knowing Christ. I have to, because my life depends on it. My life does not depend on me being a nuclear engineer or not. My life does not depend on me being a good pianist or not. My life doesn't depend on that. But my life daily does depend on my understanding of who God is and what he wants to do in my life. And so I must be, become, and I'll never be an expert in the Christian faith. You won't either. But I must strive for that. I must put in the time. I must put in the hours. I must put in the diligence. You see what I'm saying? To, to know God to the best of my ability. And so what that takes, right, is that for me, I need to have the right attitude. If I'm going to learn God's word deeply, if I'm going to strive to know God's word uh, the, the most I can, I've got to develop the right attitude. And the right attitude is not when I come to a place like this, hey, preacher, entertain me, right? Or, hey, God, give me. I want all the benefits of the Christian life, but I don't want to put any effort in. No, when I come to a place like this, the right attitude is what? Humility. Teach me. Teach me. God, I got to know. Think about this. I need to have the right, right attitude. I have to ask the right questions. I think for some of us who grew up in the church, and, and this isn't bad necessarily, it's just the way that it was. We were simply told, this is what you believe and, and, and this is what you should do. And we were never allowed to ask the question, why? And I think God wants you to ask that question. I think he wants you to ask that question a lot. I think when you read the scriptures, God wants you to enter into a conversation with him. And he wants you to ask, God, why are you saying this? God, why, why does this passage say this? God, why, why should I follow you? God, why should I believe this? Because when you get, begin to ask the question, why, that's when you begin to get the answers, you see? It's a good thing to be inquisitive when it comes to the word of God. It's a good thing. And this is why we design our life connection groups here at Northwood the way that we do. 
So when you go to that life connection group, you, you are studying the same passage that I just preached so that in that group, you can begin to ask the why questions. Why would God say this? Why would God require this of me? Why should I believe this? Those are healthy questions that we need to ask because when we begin to ask the Spirit of God those questions, those why questions, I believe that He answers those and He answers those questions firmly. You see what I'm saying? Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's how you learn. That's how you grow, right? I, I need to have the right attitude. I have to ask the right questions. I have to meditate on what I'm learning. I don't want this morning and these 40 minutes or so that I've preached to you be the conclusion of your consideration of what Psalm 119 says. You need to go home and spend some time this afternoon in this psalm. You need to tomorrow when you wake up, get back in the word of God and read this psalm again and, and think on it yourself. You need that, right? Or think about this. I have to meditate on what I'm learning. I have to respond with the right actions. Remember what the psalmist says. How does a young man keep his way pure? Not by just learning and meditating, but by what? Obeying his commands. The reason why you've gathered in this room this morning wasn't just to hear a guy talk to you for 40 minutes. It was to hear God's voice so you might know how to respond to God's voice. Or think about this. I have to talk about what I'm learning. Come back up and let me show you something else in the psalm. You see what he says, for example, in verse uh, 13. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. With my lips, I talk about it. I talk about it with people who are far from God so they might begin to understand there's a God that loves them too. And I talk about it with believers in Jesus Christ because the more I talk about what I'm learning, the more it solidifies what I'm learning and the more it's encouraging to other people. You need to talk about what you're learning in your faith. Again, that's why we have life connection groups. That's why we have discipleship groups to get you into a community where you can dialogue about what God is saying to you. You need need all of these things if you're going to learn God's will. And so you have a choice every single day of your life. Am I? Am I going to pursue, right, purity before God? And if you are, if you are going to pursue purity before God, the only way to do so is to apply God's word now, right? To apply God's word now. To, to, to learn God's word deeply, to treasure it within. This is what the psalmist is saying to us. That's the only way that we can pursue purity is with the word of God. Now, you've heard me talk now for at least 40 minutes. Now it's on you. What are you going to do? Because here's reality. What will happen on a day like today is some of you will take this message and this will be the last time you think about it. And then you will see yourself, like we talked about earlier, being discipled, not by the word of God, but discipled by this world. And you will find yourself drifting further and further away from God. Or you can make the decision this morning to continue pressing on in your faith, to continue to be a student of God's word, to learn and grow so that you might become the person that God wants you to be. And so you might be what Psalm 119 verse 1 says, oh, how happy is the man who walks blameless before God, there's joy. There's joy in pursuing a life of purity. Now, here's what I know and here's what you know. None of us do this well. You know what comes naturally to you? Not pursuing purity. I didn't have to tell you that, but you know that. Pursuing purity does not come naturally to you. What does come natural is pursuing impurity, living for yourself. Aren't you thankful that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into this world. You know what Jesus was? Absolutely pure. You know what the foundation was of the life of Jesus? The word of God. Do you remember? Do you remember? what well, We talked about it. He quoted it when he was tempted. But do you remember when, 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 when Jesus was there in the garden and they came to arrest him? Remember how Peter, he, he slashed somebody's ear off. Remember that? And you remember what Jesus said? I could right now call down legions of angels and end all of this. But I've come to fulfill what? Scriptures. He knew. He knew what the word of God wanted for his life because he knew, he knew things like what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 53. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. And we already studied it weeks ago. When Jesus hung on the cross for you and for me, what did he do? He quoted scripture, Psalm 22. Remember that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the foundation of the life of Christ was the word of God, obeying the word of God. And he did that for you because God knows you can't do it perfectly. God knows I can't do it perfectly. So God gave his son who did it perfectly for us. And Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross for you and me, he took the punishment for our rebellion. He suffered the death that we deserve. He was treated as if he had committed every act of impurity that we've committed. So that through his death and only through his resurrection, God might treat us as if we are pure. You're not pure. I'm not. We're impure. But because Jesus died in our place and rose again three days later, when God looks at us, he sees the purity of his son applied to our lives. And knowing that that's our status before God, knowing that because of our faith in Christ, that's how we stand before God, pure, holy, and blameless. What that should do for us is give us a desire to actually pursue what we are. Are you following me? This is who you are right now, present condition. You are pure before God. It's what God wants from us is to live out who we are in Christ. That's why Psalm 119 is so important. You will never be able to fulfill all of Psalm 119, but Jesus has done it for you and now gives you a desire to join him in a pursuit of purity before God. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this morning, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, come. Believe this morning that Christ died for you and rose from the dead before you, for you so that your position before God might be changed and you might be given the gift of life abundant and eternal. And if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, this morning make a renewed commitment to apply God's word now, to treasure it in your heart, right? And to learn it deeply. I know these things are things that we always talk about, but my friend, they are so important for us as we strive to be the people that God wants us to be. And so however God leads you respond, you respond. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for time and your word. Father, I pray that you would help us be a people uh, that walk in purity and holiness. And Father, I don't know the condition of every heart in this room, but you do. And I know, Father, that you are speaking in this room this morning uh, to, to, to those who've gathered. And so, Father, for that person in this room who's never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus, I pray that they would come now. And for those of us who belong to you, help us to walk in purity, I ask, and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You rise to your feet. Pastor Trey's going to be down front. You come as the Spirit of God leads you this morning.